And our guest today is Jay Rifle. He's the author of A History of the World in 10 Dinners, 2,000 Years, 100 Recipes. And Jay, we're going to talk a lot about that book, but I want to get back to what you were just saying about having written screenplays during that time in your life. Were you living in L.A.? I was. Of course, uh, because everybody has a screenplay there. <laughs> Your background sounds a lot like mine, actually, that you've done all these different things. Tell us a few of the different things that you've done outside, of course, the book that we're going to be talking about today. Um, I've had kind of a really weird career path. Um, I studied film in college and I worked in the film industry and then I worked as a hack screenwriter, which kind of drove me crazy. Um, and I kind of let's say I had a nervous breakdown and I moved to a farm and I started baking bread and um, I kind of had this epiphany that like one thing I'd always tremendously enjoyed doing was cooking. And, you know, the, writing is this very delayed gratification thing. And there's an immediacy to cooking and cooking for people is just a marvelous thing. Um, so then I actually came to New York and I went to school for French pastry because I actually have a very science background. I come from a very hard science family. Um, so I, I was much more comfortable with this notion of like weights and measures and things like that. Sure. Um, and then I worked in fine dining, uh, partially in like the kind of molecular gastronomy thing. Cause again, a lot of that is the application of pastry techniques to savory food. A lot of time. Um, you talked about pastry techniques related to the artistic nature of the, of the plating. Yeah, but also you're doing like anytime you're making fluid gels, you're working with hydrocolloids and you're you're doing a lot of stuff with micro scales, like you're measuring cocaine, you know, it's like, um, so you're doing, you know, we did a lot of stuff with like liquid nitrogen. And um, so it did feel much more like sciency and pastry like that. It was like very there's there's precision in that kind of cooking, right. um, which is I mean, and now I do historical cooking, which is like entirely the other end of the spectrum. Um, but it all it all seems to make sense for me. The through line in my mind has always been like I always think of myself as a writer first. That's what I always wanted to do and always cared about. It. And it's the other thing. I still write absurd literary fiction and get it published occasionally. And I do a lot of things like that. Um, but I still see food in this narrative context, whether that's a 10 course meal that has a start and an end, you know, a great sweep of, of, you know, cinematic meal history, um, or whether, you know, and this is where the historical cooking comes in, this uh, ability of connecting people to a narrative, a place and a time, even if it's a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, through this medium of food. And it's like any time you go to, you know, a restaurant that is unfamiliar to you, you're learning a new narrative, often of a new, you know, of a different culture, or, you know, there's every dish has this story embodied in it. So at the end of the day, I'm like the narrative guy. That's how I think about it. Yeah, I uh, I had started working in the film industry uh, while I was in college in San Diego. And I had, um, the first stuff that I sold or was optioned, I actually was still living in San Diego. And then I moved up to Los Angeles because I had a career there. But uh, And I did that for about a decade. And it was some of the most punishing years of my life. Oh, yeah. When you say that you consider yourself a writer first and foremost, you're not talking about screenwriting, you're talking about fiction or nonfiction. What kind of a writer would you really place yourself into if you had to choose a category? I mean, at the end of the day, I write experimental literary fiction or whatever, but I just, I think about everything almost in terms of writing and explaining. So I write, I write cookbooks and I write food history and I write articles and, you know, but I also wrote a lot of screenplays and some got made, some sold. None of the good ones did, you know, did all three of the things that you need to do. Um, but yeah, at the, at the end of the day, I think there is, I don't make a really big like prose versus poetry versus narrative split. Like I just had published this marvelous little story I do say so myself, that is a story in the form of a recipe. And the recipe is amazing. It's very difficult, but it's amazing. Um, and the story works too. And I kind of weave them together in a way. And that's sort of the space that I'm interested in occupying, this kind of interstitial space. Makes sense. 
much of our audience are very interested in food. However, my guess is that most aren't really cooks like you and I, and they don't have that kind of background. And that's one of the things that kind of blows me away because there's so much Zen to be found in your kitchen. And when I try to explain that to people, their eyes kind of rotate in different directions <laughs> and maybe they want to take a drive through the local drive through fast food place instead of you know, devoting that time and energy and color to their own kitchen. What do you think it is about people and why they don't really devote a little bit more creativity to that? I mean, I think these days there is kind of an explosion of of people, I think, coming to cooking in a, in a creative way. But I think a lot of people are intimidated by it and they they've missed out on that step where you just learn to enjoy it. And I think because it was such a second, third career for me, I came to it as this understanding of, oh, that's the thing that's fun. Like holding a knife and cutting vegetables and rolling pie dough. That's really fun. And putting a dish down in front of one, that's amazing. But I do think so many people are, there's so many ideas in like very rigid ideas in cooking, particularly classical stuff that like, this is right and this is wrong. And it's so intimidating that people don't, don't enjoy it. So, and they don't feel, you know, the connection that it brings. And it, like they're fascinated to watch it on TV all the time. Um, but yeah, that I, I'm always a little surprised, but I guess the thing I've been doing so much these days is like, and this is what my new book proposal is about, is like I'm teaching my younger, smarter friends, which most of my friends are younger and smarter, um, uh, about how to think about cooking, how to understand it, and how to enjoy it. Although like my like my day job, my kitchen is, it's not that zen. I actually, like my, my day job is I run a big commercial catering kitchen. Um, so I am I am a working chef on a day-to-day -day basis and we do, you know, we're a good sized company, but um it's there's a lot of hustle and bustle. Okay, so you're working as a chef or an event planning type of company? Uh, yeah, well, we've basically three parts to our business. I do some institutional stuff, all the regular catering stuff. And weirdly enough, uh, I do a lot of major league baseball. Oh, is that right? And now? Some, some basketball. Well, you got to tell me about the baseball thing because we're, we're just about leading up to the World Series. And uh, this is one of my passions in life. So tell me. Oh, amazing. So uh, tell me I, a little bit about the baseball thing. It's funny because I actually, embarrassingly, I knew very little about how baseball seasons even operate before I did this for a living. So we service probably 80% of the teams that play the Mets and then a lot of basketball teams that either, you know, play Madison Square Garden or they play multiple games. And it's a good, it's, you know, it's a large team with a lot of players and a lot of coaches. And then there's a lot of dietary restrictions and specialty stuff. And I added a whole Dominican menu because there's so many Dominican baseball players. A lot of this logistics, getting really quality food to the stadium, hot at the right time, you know. So this is the food that you're preparing for the major league ball players. Uh this is all the the teams that we would all be familiar with. These guys are all elite athletes who are multi-million millionaires and so on. Yep. So the kinds of foods that they require or ask for or request, can you break that down for us a little bit? Give me a sample of, of the foods that you would put out for a well, pro club. So there's basically three kinds of things you're going to do. Sometimes you'll do breakfast and stuff, you'll have, you know, arrival meals, and there's a post-batting practice meal, and then there's a post-game meal. And the final meal, that's when you're going to get the steaks and the lobster and the you know, seafood spreads and stuff like that. So I can imagine that a lot of the ball players, they're young kids, are they're primarily in their mid-20s, let's say. Yeah. They probably don't have sophisticated appetites, but you are going to be laying out quite the spread from, like you said, maybe sliders all the way on up to steaks and lobsters. I have very weird tastes in sports. I don't really follow any team sports. I, if I follow some silly things, I, I really enjoy like the UFC and I'm obsessed with rock climbing. Like I'm really interested in rock climbing and I climb like a lot. That's really my number one hobby. And that's actually like the genesis of my new cookbook was the fact that I hang out at a rock gym all day, which is rock gyms are kind of amazing because for whatever reason, selects for kind of intellectual people, like my rock gym is like a book club. Like the first question half the time we ask each other is like, well, so uh, have, you, have you tried that problem? And uh, what are you reading right now? And then we talk about Russian history. It's 
it's marvelous. And a lot of these people are in that, you know, that younger generation where they're starting to learn to cook. And they, everyone asks me, so yeah, I'm thinking about cooking, what are your thoughts on this? And I just realized this is a great opportunity for, you know, this is a space that I feel is a little bit underserved. There's a lot of great cookbooks out there, but they're either very, very large or they're, they don't really touch, they don't really meet that demographic in formative and humorous way, I would say. Yeah. Um, you sound like the kind of guy, very similar to myself, where you'd rather go for the funny bone than the jugular. I mean, I like explaining things to people. I came from a very like professorial family where that's just a way I'm always connected with people. Like I like to help people to understand the world and help myself to understand the world. I do follow sumo wrestling also. So okay, yeah, that is you do have some <laughs> obscure taste, definitely. I actually picked up my love of sumo. Uh, I, I lived in in Hawaii as a kid. I used to have sumo on TV, uh, and I was just kind of strangely fascinated by it. And then years and years later. When I understood like the mechanics of sumo wrestling and the bizarreness of the culture, I became kind of strangely fascinated by it. So that, and like, I also watched like strength athletics. I'm just a silly person. I would be the first to admit, you know. Going back to when you said you kind of spun out when you were in LA and you went and you started hugging trees and doing that. <laughs> How long was that phase? And what do you think it was that kind of prompted you to get the hell out? I, I ended up suffering from like severe depression. I moved to what was basically a therapeutic farm. Um, and one of the reasons I moved there was that I knew that they had a bakery that you could work at. So it was a, it was a farm where you worked, your days were short. And a lot of people were suffering from like much more legitimate, severe mental illness, you know? Um, and I hesitate to say this, but that is a magical place. I, I don't know how they do what they do. People who work there, you know, and it's not, it's not a pretty highly paid job, probably. A lot of them are vo volunteers, you know. A lot of them are deeply religious, but they never mention it, which is, in America, an extraordinarily rare thing. And it's a it's a very communal environment. There's about 100 people there. Uh, it's communal dining. The oldest person there, when I was there, I think was in their early 90s. And the youngest person there was born on the farm while I was there. So it, it really was precisely what I needed at that moment in my life. And how long were you there? I was there six, six months. Six months. That sounds like a good time to kind of like dry out and get your stuff together. Were you being medicated at the time? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about, and, how about since? Uh, have you overcome the depression and overcome any yeah. medications that you might have been on? Most I'm still medicated on a number of things, but nothing, nothing terrifying or heavy. And so, right, right. Well, everyone self medicates in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your background in pastry. You have a little bit of a formal education in pastry, however, in cooking, not as formal, but experiential. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm technically a pastry chef, but I'm also a savory chef. I cook classical Indian. I cook classical Chinese, um, regional Chinese. Uh, I'm just a nerd for learning new things and learning techniques and whether it's pastry techniques or savory techniques. That's what makes it so interesting when you can see these techniques that people have been doing forever up until the last 50 or 100 years. Right. And there's yeah. ones that are completely lost. Like there's an amazing dish in the cookbook that is a whole fish cooked three ways simultaneously. And it's from the 10th century Baghdad chapter. And I, 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 I love that chapter. That was that was really appealing to me. And that this, we're talking about a history of the world in ten dinners, right? Yes. Yeah. So tell people about that particular dish. That dish and that chapter. I just have to say, like tenth century Baghdad, you have to remember that it was the jewel of the world. It was the height of human culture in that moment. Maybe parts of China as well. In a time when. 300 years later, a European cookbook was going to be a series of like, take this and this and this and this and cook it and serve it forth with no weights and measures, no times, nothing. Or 400 years before that, Tensory Baghdad, you have this epic tone. It's huge. It's like 900 recipes. It's 500 pages. It was richly illustrated. It has weights and measures. It has techniques. And it's filled with poetry and stories. It is the greatest cookbook ever written in human history. Like, it just is. 
There's like a couple others that are close to my heart, but that book is incredible. And shout out to the translator, Anela Nasrullah, because it was, I mean, her translation is amazing. She's amazing. The amount of work that must have been is insane. So one of the, the great recipes from that is a whole fish cooked three ways simultaneously. And this was a, a large fish that is um, stuffed with aromatics around the head. And then it's placed in a tandoor oven, which is, you know, much like an Indian, you know, tandoor or the tandoor is still used in the Middle East. And you wrap the fish in, like you wrap the center of the fish in layers of oiled cloth. And then you put a thin layer of very oiled cloth on the tail. So the idea is the head roasts and the middle part poaches and the tail fries. And you do this all sim by putting the whole thing in the oven at once and then taking the, the layers off afterwards. Oh, um, you're saying that's in a tandoor oven, which is a, primarily a vertical space. So it is. So are you I standing you're, the fish up? I assume you're standing it up because I actually did yeah. a bunch of tests on this. So you're, I, I think you're actually putting it on a, on a plate and kind of submerging it to the bottom. Okay. Once again, the book is called The Annals of the Caliph's Kitchen. So this was for the Caliph, but often, you know, these the people would be cooking for hundreds and hundreds of people. So they had some very, very large ovens to work with. There's even a crazy recipe, which is the same recipe where you take all the meat off and make a, a farce, make a force meat of it. And then uh -huh. you put the skin back on and you tie it with reeds and you do a, the whole fish that way as well. Very fancy. I like that one. When weights and measures came in, things became more precise. Do you think that's what turned people off from cooking? And what spices were they using back then? Well, spices you see a lot of in, in that era. I mean, the, the one that they use a lot that we don't use a lot is sumac, which is still, you know, you get a lot of that. And a lot of cilantro, and they use a lot of saffron is, is very popular. They also had a condiment. And, you know, every culture has their, like, savory umami-packed condiment. Okay. Ancient Middle East had this uh, condiment called muri, which is, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing that, I apologize to everyone, which was a dry ferment of barley, and it takes about like three months to make it. I actually consulted extensively with a food scientist to make my sort of mock muri. It comes out like very, very thick soy sauce, and in fact, the, what I ended up using for it is uh, soy sauce and marmite. You know, that sounds very similar to what Max Miller, the guy from Tasting yeah. History, he makes garum. Right. And it sounds like it would be very similar to that in nature and flavor and richness. Garum is surprisingly similar, I mean, to like Thai fish sauce, you know, like South right, Asian fish sauce. Right. It's very much the same thing. Or they actually, I mean, nowadays you can get artisanal garum, but it's the same thing as what they used to call anchovy essence for, okay. a, for Italian cuisine, which is different from like anchovy paste. It's still that thin liquid, I would say Murray is closer to something like a soy or a dark soy, or mm -hmm. even I think koji fermented than it is to fish sauce. And I adore them both. Tell us a little bit more about one of the other fantastic recipes from a history of the world in 10 dinners. Um, the ones that, are, the ones that always strike me are like, 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 you know, perhaps the most iconic one is the cock and thrice. And I'm kind of known for this, which was uh, from Tudor, England. It was very popular with Henry Tudor. It's a mythical animal. So it's a suckling pig that's sewn to a capon and then right. stuffed with the meat from the pig and dried fruits and spices. And it's positively terrifying, but it's also quite delicious. But it looks like, you know, it looks like this hybrid big chicken creature. It's it's awesome. It sounds like it was the precursor for the turducken. Yes. Right? There, yeah. There's actually also, there's a very cool uh, Chinese classical dish that's like a turducken. I believe it is a chicken with a duck with a pigeon in it. And it's, you know, it's, it's cute. There's a one from 19th century New York, which is the final chapter of the book, which is from uh, Charles Ranhofer's The Epicurean, with the edition I have is like 1894, I believe, which is probably my second favorite cookbook in human history. Ah. It's 2,000 pages of crazy shit. And like these amazing illustrations that it's just, it's just, it's crazy. But- uh -huh. But it's savory and there's, you know, all that stuff in there. And it's 
a giant pain in the ass. But it sounds like, like it's a artwork suspended in aspect. It's a, it's amazing. I mean, like they uh -huh. did a lot of crazy stuff uh, with aspect because the complete recipe then goes on for another page and explains that you need to make this like armature and then you decorate the whole thing with more aspic and truffles and stuffed coxcombs and like sheep's testicles or whatever. And this is this is funny because each one of your chapters pairs menus with immersive retellings of historic culinary breakthroughs, right? And presents these oddball ingredients, like you just mentioned, <laughs> utilizing modern techniques, but no one is going to go find any lamb's testicles. They do come in pairs, by the way. Yes. And, and no one's going to put any of these recipes together. What you've presented here with your book is definitely the ultimate coffee table book, because even chefs who are going to hang on to that book or grab that book probably won't be making those dishes. They're that intricate. Yeah. So I, I try in every chapter to have some dishes that, you know, that anyone can make. There's actually some that are like not particularly challenging, you know, and some of those are very, very delicious. You know, there are, there's a lot of people who do like to challenge themselves, you know, and there are oddly enough, the most difficult recipe in the book and certainly the most difficult to test and develop. It was uh, injera, the Ethiopian flatbread. Oh, yeah. The that very is spongy kind really of bread. really finicky. It has a bunch of steps. Making it from just actual 100% teff flour, which is the, the flour that you use uh, in Ethiopia, is difficult. But that recipe genuinely works. Mine actually starts with a sourdough starter. You can actually, you can sourdough ferment your own teff if you want. And then you basically migrate the, the starter out of there. A lot of people, you can also do it with a little bit of like all-purpose flour, which will make your life easier. It's still tricky. But there's a whole bunch of steps. And the thing is, you know, most people, I would say 99% of people who make injera are Ethiopian women. Although Ethiopian food is interesting, a lot of stews that satellite themselves around the bread, it never really, really caught on in the United States. And we love various different kinds of ethnic cuisines, but that really still hasn't caught on, has it? It's probably more popular here. Like most people I know are like, yeah, I like, you know, I like Ethiopian food. I live in Queens in New York which I believe is the most diverse food space in the world. Like, right, what can't also, you get Yeah, it's Queens, also linguistically right? the most diverse place in the world, I think. That's right. Um, and we definitely, in New York, have a couple really excellent Ethiopian restaurants. But yeah, outside that, unless you're, you know, in Washington, we have a big Ethiopian community, you know, there is not, and it, it doesn't have the cachet. But I mean, once again, I'm old enough to remember when Thai food was crazy. Like, when, have you heard right. about this thing called Thai food? There's, a, there's a, a, a lot of cuisines. Remember when we were younger and people made jokes about sushi? Like, it was a joke food? Like, who would want to eat raw fish? Oh, yeah. And now yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, you spend 900 bucks on a sushi restaurant today. You know? I remember the first time I ate raw fish, and uh, it didn't do it for me. And that was in 1976 <laughs> in London. Yeah. If you remember the Breakfast Club, John Hughes movie, uh, Molly Ringwald famously eats sushi for lunch. And the guy says, you won't let a uh, guy put his tongue in your mouth, but you'll eat raw fish. But of course, this dovetails into my next question for you, which is, what have you eaten today? Oh, today's a funny day because I actually, a very odd coincidence, was actually making some Ethiopian food. I was making some shiro wat. I, we're doing a, a very large party tomorrow, which is one of these Taste of Brooklyn things. So we have... 20 different food representing different famous restaurants or different cultures within Brooklyn. So I actually was making some shiro what, which is basically a pulses stew that's quite lovely. Um, and, oh, uh, we had some cod left over. And my friend is an extremely talented Vietnamese chef, and he did a kind of uh, Vietnamese cod dish that was super spicy and really, really lovely. So he's one of my sous chefs and a ridiculously talented fellow. And then he had uh, like a vinegar cilantro uh, hot pepper sauce. What do you think vinegar is so important in a lot of dishes? Because doesn't acid typically firm up the proteins instead of making it tender, which is, I think, most people's belief? Yeah, I mean, I think most people don't want, you know, like it cooks, acid cooks things. I mean, I, I think that's probably not why acid is so popular in, in food. This is going to pivot back to 10th, 10th century Baghdad again, but I have a very like sharp palate. Like I love acid. I, I think, you know, like there are a lot of like ceviches and stuff that where the food is cooked with acid. I think in most cases, the amount of vinegar and the time that things are in vinegar is not doing a whole lot 
to, for example, meats. I don't think it's it's making them that much tender unless you really are putting right. a lot of acid for a couple of days. I think sour flavors are awesome. The acne of sour food culture may have been 10th century Baghdad. They loved vinegars and seasoned vinegars. They made all these fermented dairy dairy product sauces. They, they did a lot of like verju, where you're using, you know, the juice of unripe grapes. It was all, and like all these interesting ferments. So they just really loved sourness in like all its like little gradations. And when you go back into the monkey brain, the ancient brain, a lot of uh, a lot of our survival techniques have to do with not enjoying flavors like that because they they kind of resemble poisons, so to speak. Yeah, especially so, bitterness. Right, and so that's that's something that I haven't noticed. I, I notice that a lot of people don't eat olives, don't like vinegars, don't enjoy pickles, don't like fermented stuff. I make fermented stuff all the time at right. home, but a lot of people don't enjoy the the really really dark dank cheese. The right. old stuff, you know? Which I really love. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. But a lot of people kind of steer clear of that. And I just wonder if that's because in the DNA, it says steer clear of those kind of flavors. I mean, I think there's a, a huge correlation between bitter foods and foods that are poisonous in, in nature or that are bad. And there's also that, you know, that, you know, that thing that you and I probably think of as the complexity of flavor is also, you know, a lot of that is spoilage. You know, and in fermentation, it's controlled spoilage. And there's stuff that's like way too rough for me to eat. You know, have you ever tried like stinky tofu? Is like a bridge too far. You, you know, know, it's interesting. When I was reading your bio, I noticed that you said you've baked bread with schizophrenics, but I don't ever remember meeting you earlier than today. <laughs> yeah, that was one. That, someone once took me to task for that. And no, hey, some uh, of my best friends are schizophrenic. Act to myself as well. But, um, you know, w <laughs> when I was at the farm, as I say, they treat a number of people with severe illnesses. And I, I used to work in this bakery between these two marvelous but severely schizophrenic gentlemen who would occasionally do strange things or one would just occasionally stop, like become absolutely still for 10 or 15 minutes and right. clearly had a very involved in her life. Uh, and he was actually like a very bright, talented, really sweet person, but, it, you know, had... Just challenges, you know, and I, I, those were tremendous learning spirits for me. I, you know, uh, and I was, I was a total mess. So I'm, you know, I was, I was not remotely meaning that in a, in a, to be glib or fast off. So many Turns things can coexist at the same yeah. time. So it's cool. Breaking, <laughs> that, that yeah. definitely caught me. Yeah. Baking bread is, I mean, like baking bread is such a beautiful thing. It's really fun. You know, that really took off. During the COVID time, yeah. have you noticed that in your circle, your social circle or professional circle, that a lot of people were doing a lot of bread stuff? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, also, I live right near one of the kind of hipster ground zeros, and I work in a hipster ground zero. So I think it hit those areas even like harder. But uh, yeah, a lot of people were asking my bread advice uh, in, in the height of the pandemic. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Food Network, because when there were rumblings first began about this network coming to television and so on. I, I so wanted to have a show there. And then, you know, of course, like everyone else watched it ceaselessly yeah. for many years. And then I, I know that you competed on the show called Chopped, which is interesting to me. I want to talk about that in a, in a minute, but the point I'm trying to make is that food and television and all of that used to be about learning to cook. And when we right. used to watch Julia and Jacques and, and all of these yeah. great folks, you know, Graham Kerr, they taught you how to cook. And then it became something different. It became competition eventually, yeah. which is wild to me. And in between, it became this kind of like race or battle. Right. What do you, do you have a personal feeling about what food became, how it started on the Food Network and what it's now become, which is kind of like a shit show? Yeah, I mean, it certainly started, at, you know, as cooking shows with, you know, personalities telling you how to cook relatively easy things that you could do. I used to learn recipes from like the Food Network a million years ago. And, you know, I, I, really, I really enjoyed that. Um, I will admit that um, when Iron Chef came out on PBS, which was like the Japanese show, a show right. that I have watched so much of, like, I have watched that show so much. It's kind of absurd. It's just like one of my happy places. Um, and it was, it was, it was almost on as like, as like a joke. It was almost on like, you know, um, but then, you know, the cold competitive cooking thing, you know, people like drama, people like 
competition. I think in America, it probably grew more out of the explosion of reality TV and, you know, all those like, like MTV reality TV shows. And I don't think it adds a lot to the cooking space. I think it's a fun intellectual exercise. It's like a game. It's a game you can play. If you give me three ingredients, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my dishes. If you give me one ingredient, I'll give you my Iron Chef dishes, you know, but you know, I think they're fun. Um, I've done a couple of those shows. I've lost on them. I've won on them. I think the whole competitive food thing is about the, the worst combination of ego and, and technique that I could possibly even think of. If you're competing with yourself, that's one thing. But if you're competing to the guy next to you, right. it becomes, it's just too real and, and distasteful to me. I think certainly the last time I did it, um, it, where I did win, I had just nothing but a sense of humor about it. Like I knew it was absurd, you know, and, right. and some of these shows have gotten so ridiculous. I don't know if, it, but if you think about it as like, it's just athletics at that point. And that's fine. People like athletics. It's like competitive dancing. You know, but like, who does, who does opinion? There? Bobby Flay in his early years was just that. I mean, he was full of piss and vinegar and he would jump all over the place. He'd put it in your face and all that. And it took me a long time before I could accept him into my life. And it was finally when I found <laughs> out that he loves cats. And I said, <laughs> okay, he's all right. <laughs> I think also, I think there's, I think there's a lot of people like on, on both sides, I think, you know, like to, to be that kind of a chef, uh, like on, on TV, you have to have the ability to turn it on. And mm -hmm. I respect that. I think there are, and I'm not going to name names, but I think there are people who on TV are total dicks and reality are not. And Jay, I think they're- this show is all about naming names. <laughs> Come on, man. You know, I mean, there are people, so I have heard- you know, um, that, that some people who come off as extremely nice are also absolute psychopaths in in the kitchen, you know, yeah. or just in real life are really unpleasant people. Is that the money, fame, power thing that's kicking in when people go from regular, normal, okay people to the types of folks we're describing now? I think so. And I think I think there's some people who also perhaps most interesting to me are people who play dicks on TV, but are nice people. I think that's uh -huh. that is an interesting thing. Or like there's there are judges on on Chop, for example, who like like the minute the camera's on act like they, you know, they they fake fight, like they bicker at each other and they criticize each other. And, and they it's and, and then the camera turns off and you can tell their friends like that. It's, it's a total shtick. As but is mainstream news, right? Everything's, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I, I think it's a bad thing, but I think it's it's very it's very understandable. But anyone who performs on stage, they realize what people like and you build a character and you be that character. And, you know, I think. Some of these people at some point realized, oh, people have this idea that chefs are dicks and they're loud and they're mean, and I'm going to be that. Although, you know, in real life, some of them are, it's a difficult job. And a lot of, them, you know, for whatever reason, kitchens traditionally were an abusive environment. There was real hazing that came up. And then, you know, I've worked in kitchens with a very nice head chef, but who has an absolute bulldog for a, for a chef de cuisine. You know, yeah. I have always the one thing. And once again, I don't, you know, I don't run a, a Michelin star kitchen. I run a big catering company. It's incredibly important for me to have a really positive work environment. Like I have a lot of people and I want them to be happy to come to work and go home happy and work. They'll work really hard for you that way, you know, and they'll do a great job and they'll have pride in their work. But like, I don't, I don't yell. I don't allow yelling. I don't intimidate people. I, you know, I'm, I have a very polite workforce. And if you can't be that in my kitchen, you can't work in my kitchen. That's a very evolved approach. <laughs> and you're speaking to somebody here. I work under a brutal guy with a Napoleon complex when I was serving my apprenticeship. Little teeny guy, had the worst attitude. He threw knives at us. And <laughs> it was like he believed in the old world stuff. Yeah. And does that make people better? I'm not a fan of that or a believer in that. I don't but think that's it does. the way a lot of people were, you know? Yeah. I think I think people get better in all sorts of ways. Some people respond to that. I've actually known I've actually known guys who dug that, actually. I I know a chef who's uh he's ex-military and he actually that's how he likes to be motivated. Like he likes to be abused. It works for him. And I I, I respect that, I guess. It, whatever works for you, you know, I don't want to be in that way. But I mean, I, I like I worked at a place, you know, fine dining place where I remember someone getting in someone's face and sh shrieking at them that if you can't do this, 
you should kill yourself right now. Right. You should kill yourself. He was screaming and it was like white in the face. Like it was just madness. And I'm like, really? the whole abuse thing is, is very yeah. military, you know? Yeah. Uh, what's next with you? You see yourself in this world where you're going to be writing, producing art, creative spaces, places and dishes and flavors and communicating with folks. Is that what your future looks like to you? Do you have anything immediate that we should know about? I mean, yes, you nailed it precisely. That's that's my plan. Um, I have high hopes for my new general purpose cookbook. I think people are really going to uh, respond to it. But that, you know, that's out in the ether right now. And, you right. know, if it got picked up tomorrow, it would still be 16 months away or something. I do some kind of absurd things. I mean, I'm all like, I'm always writing stuff. I'm always going to write fiction. I always have that kind of stuff. I have been making these informative cooking videos while I rock climb. So if you want to uh, hear someone explain like how to blanch and poach while hanging upside down, I'm your guy. I just started doing that oh, recently. I've gotten cool. a, a really fun uh, response. Um, is that in a rock gym or is that on the yeah. side of a cliff? Um, mostly in a rock gym. I actually just okay. came back from a climbing trip and I meant to shoot a video out there, but the, the climbing was pretty intense. I just came back from a, a trip, uh, to Red Rocks in Nevada, which is spectacularly beautiful and the climb is insane, but no, mostly, you know, mostly I climb in a climbing gym. And also the truth is if you want to make a funny video where you talk while hanging upside down, like I think people who climb in rock gyms don't realize that in the real world, there's not a whole lot of really inverted stuff that you could climb, certainly not while talking, because it's just the, the rock doesn't afford the kind of big handholds you need to really hang upside down from in most places. That's That's been a really fun thing I've been doing lately. Always got some projects in, you know, in the mix. I have a number of uh, podcasts that I'm, that I'm on and come out. I have a couple really fun ones coming out soon. Uh, one talking about the ancient Roman dinner from hell. That's a Halloween podcast. And I was just on a uh, a podcast talking about horror films and film and horror films. And that oh, was fun. really fun. I just had the story published, you know, do stuff like that. I'm always, always doing a lot of stuff. I'm building a couple of funny little things and always doing something. Do you have any kids or pets? Nope. No. Single, <laughs> single guy, wife? Partner? Currently single. Currently single. Currently single and not, not really looking. You're interesting. If people want to check you out, learn about what's up next, or they want to buy a stream of the world in 10 dinners, how would they do that? Where would people find you? Probably the best is my Instagram, which is J Rifle, J A Y R E I F E L. Or I uh, recently started TikTok, which is the same. It's the, it's the silly climbing videos and me talking about food. You can go to my website, jrifle.com. The book is sold at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and wherever fine books are sold. What about the ones that are not so fine? <laughs> be there too i don't know okay um you know if you have if, if you have cooking questions and you want them answered by some guy hanging upside down hit me up i like that we think but, uh, to, one day we should get together for a couple of beers and get our knives thank you so much jay rifle for hanging out with me i hope you had a good time today i had a marvelous time thank you so good. much for having me is there anything i didn't ask you that i should have that you'd like to share i kind of think we got everything i mean there's you know i i would say reach out. You know, if, if, if people like want to learn about what I do, um, you can reach out to me directly. I'm a pretty, I'm, I don't have a wife and kids and a dog. So I, you know, I'm always working. I love it. Do you find that engagement is down, let's say in the last five years than it was prior to the last five years, just as far as people communicating back and forth, I'm talking outside your kitchen. I think so. I, I mean, I, I think the pandemic did something weird to our society and also things like the current political situation. I think people are still wrapping themselves around the problems with the level of communication that the internet provides and the ability to be kind of hermetically sealed with like-minded people. I've often argued that like, and I've said this in like somewhat impolite ways, but like, it's probably better if you have a friend with some terrible ideas for two, because you should remember that those people exist and they're people, you know, that you might have somebody who you actually like and care about, but is like kind of a bastard or like has some really unsavory opinions. But, you know, it's important to have some kind of dialogue and to have some kind of compassion for people whose opinions that you don't respect, but you might still 
respect other parts of their character. I, I think, uh, and I think it is very easy not to do that. And I think on both ends of the spectrum, there's a lot of people who just, they have a bunch of litmus tests and they cut people out very, very rapidly and very effectively. And I, I think it's a mistake. You know, I think you should argue with your friends, not stop talking to them. I love that. It's a great philosophy because canceling and uh, ghosting have become way too big. Yeah, days, it's, it's you know? that I think is a particularly bad trend in, in yeah. our society right now. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, it's probably all due to the social media and the fact that we're all behind screens nowadays and you do feel protected and you could be the bad boy or the bad girl and not suffer any repercussions from that. I, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. So cook for your friends. This is my advice. Cook, cook, cook for your friends. Have them over. Invite them over. Cook some food. Excellent advice. Uh, that, that is like right out of my book, too. So thank you. That was great, Jay. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. Take care. Take care. Aloha. Aloha.